just say a few words before Vincent will, will take over to talk about his book, his extraordinary, excellent book, with its excellent preface, which you just heard the first lines. <laughs> Uh, oh, there's a I hold it right here. Uh, Nicholas Nabokov was, of course, cosmopolitan, as he said. He was brought up quadrilingual, and he was, in his life, pertinent to, uh, interested in, and very, very, very articulate in all four spheres of culture. That these languages represented Russian, German, French, and English. This was, at one point, his salvation; other point, his damnation. But he, he, in all these fields, <coughs> managed to make considerable amount of friends in all sorts of fields, in all realms of of literature politics and even science. Oppenheimer was a friend of his. But the basic undercurrent which underlay all of that was music. He was, first of all, a composer. He did not go to college because <coughs> historical events decried something else. But he did go to the gymnasium. He did go to the conservatories in, in Germany and, and in Berlin. And his sort of three big geographical realms were uh, Berlin in the 20s, Paris in the 30s, and America. It was a return to Europe after the American, and he became his wonder, Yada, in fact, took place mainly when he was at the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and he traveled all over the world. <coughs> and that has somewhat obscured his work as a musician to which Vincent pays considerable and generous attention in his remarkable book. But let me first ask Vincent, why did you, how did you decide to write about such an extravagant person? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the, the book is an act of friendship, really, uh, and that's how it started. I, uh, as I explained in my introduction, about 25 years ago, I think, through our friend Eileen Finletter, I got to know Dominique, so uh, Nicholas's last wife, and we became very good friends, and so a lot of her. And then a few years later, and but many years ago, we became acquainted with you and with Claude um, through Francine Duplessis Gray, so another um, friend we had in, in, in common. And I had known Nicholas's name for, for, for a long time. In fact, I remember exactly how I became aware of him as a musician. It was in 1973, when I was not very old, uh, and when his last opera was uh, uh, premiered in, in Brussels by the, uh, by the Deutsche Oper. So it was done by the Berlin uh, company uh, visiting Brussels. And there was quite a lot of press um, about it. I remember an article by uh, Auden and Chester Coleman writing about their, their libretto. Um, so it really was quite a, a big event. Um, and, and I was, the name Nabokov was very familiar uh, to me, but I'd never heard of, of uh, Nicholas Nabokov. And then um, a few years, uh, so I, unfortunately I didn't get to go to Brussels. I read the, the reviews, which were actually very, uh, interesting. And um, a few years later, as part of my uh, work as uh, a curator at Yale, I became acquainted, uh, acquainted with those um, um, extraordinary, and, and personally acquainted with those extraordinary uh, emigre circles in Paris, especially uh, Polish emigre circles. I went to Maison Lafitte many times when uh, Cultura was um, Established, and I, I, I got to know them. Be, be, uh, they were elderly by then, but I uh, know some of them in the early 90s. And uh, um, and through that uh, ex exposure to, to, to the work of those, those immigrant circles who worked under such 
difficult circumstances in the 1950s and 60s uh, when uh, I don't need to remind you but the, the, the French uh, uh, public opinion uh, was, was not exactly um, in their favor and I heard for the first time about the Congress of Cultural Freedom and what, uh, what had been uh, done then and, and, and again Nabokov's name um, uh, came up so it became obvious to me that that was a, that was a very interesting story that had never been told. Uh, or when it has been told, um, <laughs> it has uh, not been told in the way I, I felt comfortable with. So uh, I, I, I became convinced um, a few years ago, that really uh, there was a kind of injustice that had to be um, uh, repaired. <laughs> so that's how that's how it came about. Now, how how uh, how good a job I I I did is now for for the readers of the book to, to uh, decide. Well, I thought you did an extraordinary job because you did an enormous amount of research and showed up things, many many things which. I had never heard of Claude, I had never heard of perhaps Dominique had never heard of either, although she had a lot of the material there on which you, you started, which started off your research. But uh, uh, first, Nicholas himself wrote two autobiographical books and left a considerable amount of manuscript unpublished at his death. Uh, now, you of course had to look into those uh, to begin with. And Nicholas, part of his charm, and certainly not in all of it, but a good deal of it, and uh, an important part of it, was his, his charm and his, his ability to tell stories. And he wrote them very, very well, very amusingly, in quite good English and quite good French, uh, translated by Claude. Uh, but uh, he did have this ability when he was excited, interested, and so on. He would embroider, of course, memory and, and its failures helping. Uh, and the embroiders sometimes must take, the embroidery must take some time to unravel, I suppose, to get at the bare facts of the tissue underneath. How did you manage to do that? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I'm not sure I succeeded in, in uh, unraveling all the uh, embroidery. I, I try to be as honest as uh, I, I, I can when I, when I, I retell those uh, uh, stories. And in some cases I say, well, I don't quite think it happened that way, or I know it cannot have happened that way. On the other hand, um, some of the um, extraordinary stories about him and his life uh, turn, out, turn out to be perfectly true. And they're, they're, they're confirmed by, for example, the diaries of Prokofiev. You know, Nabokov got to know Prokofiev in the late 20s, and very well. Uh, they traveled together uh, with, with Prokofiev's wife. Uh, and, and, and There's a picture of them in bed together, but, <laughs> but, but two, in bed together with two women. Two women. <laughs> so, uh, and, and Prokofiev's diaries uh, came to light a few years ago. They were published in Russian, and they've now been translated to English. And some of the some of the stories are completely uh, confirmed by uh, Prokofiev. Uh, so very one of those extraordinary friendships. Uh, the, the book is, is full of. You know, Prokofiev is just one of them. It's, it's, so, um, uh, one story, uh, since we're, we're, we're among friends, uh, one, one story I can't quite believe as told, and I, I try to indicate that I have slight doubts. It's a, it's a very, very famous story, repeated by everybody. It's, it takes place in Berlin, and it's uh, Nabokov. Uh, being asked to uh, uh, be present that evening because Yesenin and Isadora Duncan are going to be uh, there. Uh, I'm sure he met them, but I'm not 
quite sure it happened that way. Because uh, it's too good to be true. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so far, I've not been able to find uh, confirmation that it really uh, happened that way. Uh, the, 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 what, what makes me a little skeptical is that the, it's supposed to have taken place in the presence of Harry Kessler. Well, Harry Kessler was one of the 20th century ult <laughs> ultimate name droppers. And if it had happened, he would have uh, written about it in his diary. <laughs> Uh, so, it, since it's not there, well, uh, I have to put a, a, a slight question mark over the whole episode. No, Harry Kessler, of course, was important in Nicholas's life at that time. In the 20s, Harry Kessler was a, uh, a mécène, patron of the arts, uh, who had a, a, a very beautiful printing press in, in, in Germany and was a, 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 a big uh, forerunner, shall we say, a booster of the whole Bauhaus movement and his house was a famous Bauhaus monument. He lost all his money and his life during the war. Uh, but he did, he did write about Nicholas in the book, uh, going to the Comte Escarpe where Nicholas at the time, extremely poor, he and his wife, my mother, were chasing the devil by the tail, as they say. And uh, he had a little tiny studio with a very beaten, broken down old piano, which he still had at his death, which we inherited and tried to get rid of very different. Uh, and he saw this uh, composer who was then uh, being picked by Jagadev to write a ballet, and he said, how could people live in such poverty <laughs> so, and make such tremendous noise on the piano with the neighbors being worried about it. He was very worried about that. <laughs> so, but he did write very charmingly about him and he invited him to dinner and so on. <clears throat> anyway, that's uh, that was the 20s in Paris. What of Berlin? Did you manage to find a lot of things about Berlin? Because Nicholas said he had been in Busoni's class. Busoni, the pianist and composer, gave a famous composition class, which took place in his Busoni studio, and not in any classroom, and really, I think, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Court Weil had been two years before in Busoni's class. Nicholas is always vague on the subject, but I suspect he never really did go to the class. <laughs> Why not me? Uh, I haven't found any uh, hard evidence that he, he uh, attended Busoni's class. Or not. I suspect he did, because it was, it was uh, open to everybody. Uh, whether he had any real contacts with Busoni and whether uh, is uh, is is uh, more questionable. And he himself didn't have such a good memory of, of Busoni. He, uh, in fact, he didn't like many of his uh, composition uh, uh, teachers. Although grudgingly he acknowledged that he actually learned something in, in, in Germany, but he came to the conclusion that he should have gone to uh, France instead that uh, things were more interesting musically and he he didn't like some of the some of, of the great admirations of his uh, teachers like uh, Fitzner or Max Reger he thought Max Reger was the worst composer of the 20th century or um, <laughs> um, so but but on the other hand uh, what uh, well there is a lot of uh, evidence for in uh, for his German years, in the, the, his first German years, in uh, um, the, the early 20s, be, between 1920 and 1924, is the extraordinary contacts he uh, made there. And uh, almost by, by, by chance, he went, when the Nabokov family left Russia, they, they, they left uh, Crimea on, on, this, on the same boat, practically, and they went to Greece. First, so they spent a few months in Greece, and then they went to all kinds of directions. And uh, Nicholas went to Holland first because one one of his uh, 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 uncles, I think, was was uh, a, a con was the American consul uh, um, in La Hague, and almost by chance he met a, a German diplomat. Who had, uh, who happened to be in the Hague at the, at the same time. A German diplomat who was from Alsace, 
and therefore was in the position of having to decide whether he was going to remain German or whether he or would become French, uh, which was a choice all Alsatians were given at the time. And because for family reasons he decided to uh, uh, return to Alsace where the family was from and, and, and settle there permanently rather than become a German diplomat. And um, an extraordinary friendship was formed just uh, like that uh, on, on that on that particular uh, day. And uh, Alexander Grunelius, that was his name, a very good uh, family whose wife was a Schlumberger, very good uh, Alsatian background, uh, gave him letters of introduction to uh, his friends in uh, uh, Germany. And one of them was, one of those letters, was for, this, for the son of the former uh, Chancellor, Bettmann Holweg. And Felix Bettmann Holweg became another lifelong friend. You know, one of those extraordinary uh, members of the, of the German aristocracy, cultured, uh, uh, worldly, uh, uh, rich, fun, <laughs> everything you could possibly. And, and, and he and Nicholas became very close friends. And another one, uh, it's a more tragic story, was um, uh, Albrecht Bernstorff, who's another diplomat, very active in, in uh, circles in, at Oxford, especially where, they had, where he had studied, uh, to um, uh, form cultural ties between uh, Germany, young Germans, and, and young Englishmen. And of course, all that was ruined by the First World War. And uh, Bernstorff later on became a, a, a staunch uh, opponent to Hitler. In fact, he became Ribbentrop's Bet Noir and was eventually arrested and, and murdered in 1945. He was uh, well, a member of that. Uh, other Germany, uh, which may not have been the majority, but, but still existed and, and, and uh, paid a horrible price for its uh, uh, commitment uh, against Nazism. So Nabokov was, was, became a, a, a member of those, those marvelous uh, uh, circles in, in Weimar uh, Germany, which, which later were, were wiped out. Now, Bettmann Hoveck survived, but like an, an, an émigré de l'intérieur. He, 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 uh, he didn't have anything to do with the, with the, with the regime, far, far from it, and tried to preserve uh, uh, as much uh, independence and, and peace as he could. But you know the story much no. better than I do. No, well, that's not his story, but uh, he became my, he was my godfather, and Grunelius' wife was my godmother. So there are, these are terribly old friends. And, but, they, but Nicholas was much involved in German life at the time, as he was in Paris, as he was in America, in the intellectual life of his time. Music was his staff of life, was what basically kept him going, with what, the basic thing in his life, what he loved most. But music could extend to all sorts of, could extend to literature, he had all sorts of writers uh, who wrote texts for him, whose texts he adapted from, from Joyce to, uh, I don't know, Hoffman style. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and most of these people were friends, not of course Joyce, but uh, and he, he would like that to, at the end of his life. Auden was, of course, a great, great friend, Winston Auden, who was an influence in Stravinsky's life, important, uh, from what who, of intellectual and literary options to take, and also, of course, the co-librettist of Stravinsky's most longest and most important operatic work, The Rex Progress. Uh, but he also wrote for Nicholas, uh, Love's Labour's Lost, adapted from Shakespeare, together with Chester Coleman. Nicholas was always interested in, in poetry, whatever language it was in that he could read. And poetry, literature, thought, art, he had great friends in the art world, uh, hockey in Germany, and, and well, I, Vincent knows all this uh, very well. I, I saw this from somewhat far, of course, because my father, being my father, I did not, I saw him on an on and off basis, we say, for a long time. But we were quite close, quite close. 
and I followed his career and his music very closely. The music was always there, always there. And what's extraordinary in Vincent's book is that when, if you read it, if you were lucky enough to read it, uh, is the amount of work he did all his life. Considerable work, first of all, to keep, as I say, the, the wolf from the door, but but also because he had it, it was necessary. It was work that he was he he, he, he loved music. He always loved music, and even when he was the fifteen or so years where he was secretary general of the Congress called for Freedom and traveled all over the world, and the incredible amounts of organizational work and and congresses and concerts and the masterpieces of the 20th century in Paris in 1952 was done in two or three months. I mean, an incredible logistical feat, really, in a sense, where you read the book and find out what it involved. He still kept on composing and writing music. And that, of course, became quite obscure until after the end of the Congress, when he returned, really, to Europe and, uh, and New York and New York and New York and New York and, 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 and <coughs> taught, always taught. As a teacher, he was uh, he was not uh, a musicologist, but he knew music very well. He felt it very well. He could express things about music and musical history, which made all of his students. In fact, I've seen students of come to me say, "Oh, he was very inspiring." He was very inspiring because he himself lived what he taught. Uh, other teachers, much more knowledgeable. And he, in musical history, he would make tremendous errors and so on. Gee, you know, he would correct them later. <laughs> so, but the enthusiasm was what carried it. The enthusiasm in practically everything he did. And, uh, well, you, you could buttress that. Uh, maybe this would be a good uh, moment to listen to a few uh, <coughs> couple of minutes of Nicholas's music. And I have uh, uh, brought, among uh, other things, an extract from his uh, first work, the first, the first, not absolutely the first work uh, that was heard. He, you know, he had a work piano sonata and some songs and so on. But the first, the first, his first, his breakthrough uh, work was the ballet ode, uh, not written as a ballet. It was written as a cantata. But Diaghilev uh, thought it would be a very good ballet, and it was staged first in Paris, then in London uh, in 1928. So not the last season of Diaghilev's. Uh, ballet russe, uh, but, but the, the, the penultimate one, the, the, the last one was 1929. And um, <coughs> it's a much, it's a well known uh, ballet in the history of the ballet russe because the most, in, in some ways, the most avant garde in terms of its visual presentation. The, the set was uh, by Chelichev, it was abstract. Uh, you know, it's it's funny, very funny, but if you go to the, if you stay, in the, I think the second or the third floor of the Hotel Scribe in Paris, you will see it entirely decorated with f photos taken by um, uh, at, at the time by the Nitsky Studio of the the ballet out with with puppets hanging on wires and mixing with real characters and the lighting was was blue neon, an extraordinary um, and film, very advanced, yes. And film. Uh, and, and film uh, as well. Anyway, uh, the music sounds a little different from that, but uh, you'll you will will listen to it a little, and you you'll see what you think.
It's not immediately discernible. These people are singing in Russian. <laughs> what are they singing uh, about? The text is a, is a Russian poem by Lomonosov, 18th century Russian poet, I think the first vernacular poet, yeah. really, uh, singing the glory of the imperial court as displayed in the Aurora Borealis. Uh, <laughs> very courtly in 18th century. Well, that was Paris. Yeah. <laughs> now I think we can get to America, perhaps. Uh, Unless you want to spend more time in Paris. Uh, no, I think there would be a lot to, to uh, say, but uh, uh, I, you know, something that uh, 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 came to mind, uh, my, still in Germany, if I, but, but much later in Germany, uh, I'm looking at the, the, the wonderful Black History Month uh, display at the back of the room, and I cannot resist mentioning that uh, in, in the early 60s, uh, uh, Nabokov became uh, the uh, special advisor to the mayor of Berlin, Willy Brandt, uh, to uh, help him uh, restore the cultural prominence of, of Berlin. At the time, and we are in 1962 when the wall comes up and suddenly everyone wants to leave Berlin. And uh, the, the, there was an urgent uh, task at hand, how to make Berlin attractive uh, again. And uh, Nabokov was one of the people uh, Willy Brandt uh, consulted. And Nabokov came up with a series of very ambitious programs. One of them was to uh, invite uh, writers and artists on uh, grants and, uh, to, to spend a year in Berlin uh, with, with the help of the Ford Foundation. That's how Vitor Dobrovich uh, was able to leave Argentina after uh, more than 25 years to, uh, or about 25 years, to uh, leave Europe again. That, that, that changed his life. And, uh, um, and another idea was to uh, make the Berlin Festival into a, a larger, wider event. With the, and uh, Nabokov had uh, organized several very important festivals in Paris, in Tokyo, in, in, uh, in, in, in Rome, as well he was planning one in India at the same time. And one, of the, one idea he had was uh, there has never been a major event celebrating the important influence of Africa and, uh, and blacks generally on Western culture, uh, not just in Europe, but also in Latin America and other parts of the world. He tried to organize such a festival with a conference in Brazil, but the situation in Brazil was a, a very difficult one. It was just before the, the, the coup d'etat that overthrew President Goulart. So he sensed that it would never happen in Brazil for, for uh, political reasons. And he was right. It would not have, would not have worked. So he did it in Berlin in 1964. And uh, there was a homage to uh, President Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King uh, came and gave the opening uh, blessing. Uh, there was a performance of Jeunesse the Blacks with James Earl Jones and Langston Hughes was there. Uh, um, I cannot begin to list all the people. Uh, uh, Jimmy Baldwin was there. And now, uh, cultural historians writing about uh, 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 African-American culture mentioned that event as the first major international event uh, at which black culture was treated absolutely on the same footing as uh, other uh, Western uh, cultures. It's now seen as a totally pioneering, uh, far-seeing, far um, uh, and that was Nabokov's own idea. That's very good. No, I wasn't there either, but uh, I heard a lot about it. But he had uh, such <coughs> idea, I must say, for the Congress also, the amount of festivals, organizations, magazines, <coughs> uh, symposia that he organized uh, were astounding. But that all started in America, where, uh, where Nicholas had been invited with his family to cruise. 
me, age 13 months, and my mother, uh, by Dr. Alfred Barnes, the famous <coughs> man of the Barnes <coughs> Foundation, who had a cultural foundation which he invited European uh, intellectuals to come and spend six weeks uh, at the Barnes Institute and give lectures. And Nicholas was sort of a hot ticket at the time, and he invited him and his family to give lectures there. Uh, lectures with Barnes apparently consisted mainly of Barnes letting people talk, and after about the third lecture, Barnes would interrupt correct points of what he considered points of error, errors of fact, and, and smoke his cigar, which he was, only he was allowed to smoke. And, 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 uh, he was not, it was not a terrible reading. Uh, I think they were not, I can say, the relationship was not terrific. Uh, although Barnes did come when Nicholas had a ballet later on in New York, and he took lots of tickets for the ballet and had people, friends of his, came and cheered for <laughs> Nicky. <for Nikki. laughs> uh, but from 1933, uh, when things in Europe were getting dire, and he found the climate in America, although still post-depression, much more interesting and stimulating in a way. And they made, he made many trips back and forth between Germany, France, and America. In 1938, settled in America until <coughs> after the war. Uh, these, this period, you documented extremely well. It is documented, but uh, yes, the, also his discovery of American music and his creation, in a sense, of an American ballet. Yes, the ballet was called Union Pacific, and uh, uh, the, he wrote it with uh, Archibald MacLeish, who later became uh, Library of Congress. It was the first ballet with American theme, before Rodeo. You know, before, uh, and the, 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 the story was indeed the completion of the uh, Transcontinental uh, Railroad. It's a huge mm -hmm. success. It was done uh, all over the world by the Ballet Russe Monte Carlo, uh, Leonid Massin um, choreography. Now, in America, uh, Nabokov had to uh, find ways of making ends meet, so he became a teacher, uh, which he claimed he, he never liked. He, he referred to it as a season in college hell. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, at the same time, he was, a very, he was probably a very good teacher, a very conscientious teacher. He, he, put a lot of effort into it. He taught at Wells College in uh, uh, upstate New York, and then in, at St. John's <laughs> College, uh, Annapolis, and then at Peabody, uh, so that was more uh, along his uh, lines. But uh, all uh, along, he continued to make new friends, so uh, American composers, and Copeland, whom he got to know very well, mm -hmm. Elliot Carter, who became very, very close friend. He took uh, young Ivan to the circus, he told me. And uh, I have to say that uh, you know, the book is dedicated to William Carter's memory because he was a, a great supporter of the book. He wanted it to be done. He said uh, he thought that Nicholas's importance as a cultural force was not sufficiently acknowledged and, uh, and that he really deserved to be, to be remembered as, as someone who had helped people, uh, especially in music, not, not just in music, but especially in music, and no matter what kind of music they wrote. Uh, you know, at, at some point, uh, Boulez uh, wrote a, a, a hate letter to, a really stupid letter, he was very young, uh, to Nicholas, uh, uh, because he thought that Nicholas should be supporting Boulez's music and nobody else's music. You know, it was typical Boulez. Uh, <laughs> if I may say so. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, no, Nicholas wanted to, you know, all musicians to be able to, to, to work and write the music they wanted to, to, to uh, write. Uh, but another important uh, moment in, in uh, Nabokov's life was when he was in Washington in the early 40s. And uh, uh, there, in, through um, friends in, in had in common, um, he met uh, um, someone who became an ex extremely close friend and a very important uh, person in his life, uh, Charles Bolan, and uh, who became, as we all know, ambassador to uh, Paris and 
We're so pleased and honored to have the, the presence among us of Celestine uh, uh, and, and, uh, and through him, uh, he became acquainted with that, and with, a, with an extraordinary generation of people who uh, had been among the first diplomats to serve in Soviet Russia, uh, George Cannon, uh, and, and, and several uh, others. And uh, Nabokov therefore became a, a member of that, of that circle of people who, who uh, helped uh, d define uh, American policies vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia uh, after, after the war, when, when the situation quickly de deteriorated and uh, it, it became an urgent matter to know how to, to um, react. Now, the, that leads one, I suppose, to the, to the story of the Congress of Cultural Freedom, which has been a much uh, maligned uh, organization because, uh, as it turned out, uh, it was not entirely, but largely uh, financed with federal funds that had to be, that had to, um, be uh, transferred uh, the only way they could be transferred, which was via the, the CIA. Uh, why, I say, why do I say the only way? Well, because uh, if it had to be federal monies, if it had to be in the open, if it went uh, through Congress, Congress would, would have said, we don't finance culture. It's as simple as that. So either you did it, and you did it through covered ways, or you didn't do it. So you let uh, uh, the, the, the Soviets um, spend millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, courting favors uh, here in Paris of in intellectuals and artists, or in Italy, or, or uh, everywhere. Uh, and uh, you know, having grown up in the French system, I can tell you that you know, our teachers were all members of the Communist Party or sympathizers, and, and there was a, a there was a, a cultural war of, of sorts being, being, being fought, which had to be won. Uh, and, and, and in the end, uh, well, it was won. But uh, and the, the, the Congress of Cultural Freedom played a very uh, admirable uh, <coughs> part. Uh, and it was not, uh, contrary to what was occasionally suggested, it was not subject to uh, political pressure. You know, it, it was. Uh, uh, now, uh, I, I'm. And may disappoint uh, <laughs> some people by explaining quite clearly in the book that Nicholas was not a CIA agent himself. You know, he, he had, <laughs> uh, contrary to what has, and, and, and uh, you know, as one of his uh, colleagues who was a CIA agent in the, in the there were very few. There, there was essentially two people in the in the uh, secretariat in Paris, and as one of them. Uh, so not to me, but, but to when he was interviewed, he said, but he said, just was not the kind of personality the CIA would want to recruit. <laughs> no, too much loose cannon, I mean, too independent. You, uh, that's, that doesn't make, that kind of personality doesn't make a good agent. Would, would you agree? I certainly would agree. I would agree. But uh, how far he knew what was going on is still a moot point. Nobody quite knows. He must have suspected something. Like that. There's a, one of the major foundations that, that through which the CIA channeled its money. It, tedious to spend all this time on the sea, counterculture, but it is a record that has to be set straight. Was Julius Fleischmann and his foundation, the Farfield Foundation, and Julius Fleischmann was a notoriously stingy fellow. He was like Jean de Rocca, very stingy. <laughs> he would never pick up the tab of lunch or anything like that. But he suddenly began spending money on lunches and inviting people and spending lots of money on cultural events. People were amazed. Mm -hmm. and some people began to suspect <laughs> something was not, not his money, somebody else. Uh, but that, uh, Nicholas at the time of his death, was going to write a book about the Congress of Water Freedom and its, its funding, and, and saying, as George Kennan had written, <coughs> that Americans should be not ashamed but proud of what the Congress of Cultural Freedom managed to do since they have no Ministry of Culture and still don't have a Ministry of Culture. Mm -hmm. And money 
had to be inevitably passed by covert or operations that came from the government. Otherwise, you'd have redneck senators saying, who is the straw in the sky? Who, why are we sending the Boston Symphony Orchestra uh, to play French music and, and Russian music in Europe? No, you could just see the debates in Congress at that time, was this 47, 48, and 50 to early 60s. And the Congress, the actual State Department had managed to send with other <laughs> foundations, Porgy and Best, that was the big cultural effort, uh, with Leontine and Bill Warfield to Moscow in what, 52 or 53, extremely well written up by Truman Capote in his book, The Uses of Her. Uh, but this, this whole question has become tedious in a way, and it covers the achievement that the Congress actually did. Uh, in its magazines, its cultural activities, its symposia, in which he actually spent quite a lot of his time, energy, effort, and his health uh, deteriorated a lot because of that. He did a lot of travel, and he got to know his immense circle of friends, got even more immense because he knew people in, in Brazil, in, in Tokyo, in Indonesia, wherever the Congress would launch a festival. No, it was uh, his health actually did deteriorate, I think, because of that quite a lot. Aided to his relatively early death, I would say. Anyway, uh, but all the while he wrote music all the time. <coughs> he managed to get it performed. And although he was, as Vincent points out, his, he was stateless, he was a song. Sans domicile fixe, in a way, <laughs> and uh, an exile, therefore had no government or country behind him, even though he had been, he had a Nansen passport when he was in Europe and he became an American quite early on. But no, nobody helps American citizens who are not native born Americans, basically, unless they're Stravinsky. Uh, and he had to do all this. Because if you, if you have a country behind you, you have grants, you have awards, you have subsidies for having your work done. He did have two subsidies, one for an opera and one for a, a concert cantata at the, when the Louisville Symphony Orchestra had a program uh, for, which was had some government money behind it uh, to do American works in Louisville and, and build up the Louisville Symphony Orchestra. But uh, basically, he had to fight for himself. And since he was, he was in a position, he was, as Vincent states again, he was a generalis generalissimo of culture when he was, when he was going all over the world, organizing these events uh, to bolster Western culture, uh, not only Western, but also <coughs> Iranian, also uh, uh, Japanese. Uh, this was, became quite an institution. <coughs> broad range of but he he was loath to actually use his his position to impose a work but of course it helped in a certain sense it became that government backing which he didn't have it became a moral backing in a certain way and because of the friends he made and who liked his music and who believed in him he uh, he had certain things but somebody else in that same position would have been uh, getting put on some prizes and some things like that uh, all the time. It's difficult to